Hi, Genetic Innovation students, and welcome to your second lecture in Section 2 on Recombinant DNA Technology. In this lecture, we'll be focusing on the second learning objective, which is to describe and interpret how restriction fragment length polymorphisms are used in genotyping and variation analysis. We concluded the previous lecture discussing restriction enzymes, and we ended off by talking about how they can be used in multiple techniques such as RFLPs and molecular cloning. RFLPs are used to differentiate between DNA sources, and this is based on genetic variation between the sources of DNA. Some forms of genetic variation that's used in RFLP analyses include single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs and variable number tandem repeats. So these are like your microsatellite sequences, which have variable number of repeats in the genome. And so the length of these VNTRs can be used to differentiate between genomes. For this lecture, though, we'll be focusing on how SNPs are used in RFLP analyses. So we'll begin with a sample of genomic DNA. The genomic DNA is first treated with a restriction enzyme and then it's resolved on an amperose gel. The resulting pattern of fragments are called a DNA fingerprint. And single nucleotide polymorphisms may result in the gain or loss of a restriction site. When the restriction site is either gained or lost, this changes the DNA fingerprint pattern. And this change in the fingerprint is referred to as a restriction fragment length polymorphism, or an RFLP for short. So when we have variations in microsatellite sequence lengths, this can also alter the DNA fingerprint and form RFLPs. RFLP patterns can therefore be used to differentiate between DNA from different individuals, and this is a very useful tool in forensics. It can also be used to determine if DNA belongs to very closely related individuals and offers a useful tool for paternity testing. So now I would like to go through the concept of an RFLP and how it can be used or how a single nucleotide polymorphism can be used to differentiate between DNA from different individuals. So let's take an example here of individual A. So in individual A, we're just going to assume that the length, the total length of the sequence is approximately 250 base pairs. The sequence is not drawn to scale. However, in the middle of the sequence, what we can see here is a restriction site, GGATCC, and our restriction enzyme, HINT3, cuts off to the first G. So in individual A, if this sequence is treated with the restriction enzyme, HINT3, that cleaves at approximately 100 base pairs upstream, we'd have two fragments, one of 100 base pairs and one of 150 base pairs, if we were just to subtract it from the 250. Now, if we look at individual B, individual B has a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP within the HINT3 restriction site. So the second G has been mutated to a C. In this individual, the HINT3 enzyme can no longer restrict at this site due to the fact that there's a SNP in its recognition site. So this recognition site will no longer be able to be detected by the restriction enzyme. And so it won't be cleaved anymore. So if we were to treat both of these individuals' DNA with the HINT3 restriction enzyme and electrophores or resolve these fragments on an agarose gel, what would we see? So here's an example of an agarose gel. And since there was a restriction site present in individual A, we should be able to see two fragments, one of 150 and one of 100 base pairs, as the restriction enzyme would cleave the restriction site at this position. However, in individual B, there will no longer be a restriction site, and so the sequence will no longer be cleaved. And so we'd end up with a fragment of 250 base pairs on the agarose gel. And this can differentiate between these two individuals due to the presence of the SNP in individual B. Using the same concept, 
RFLPs can be used to differentiate between individuals who are healthy and individuals who have a disease. So in this example, the individual with the disease has a point mutation in the MST1 restriction site. So whereas a normal or a healthy individual would have an MST1 restriction site located somewhere here, the diseased individual no longer has that restriction site. So we can now determine if the individual has the disease using RFLP analysis. Genomic DNA is extracted from both the normal and the diseased individual. The genomic DNA is then digested with the MST1 restriction enzyme and resolved on an agarose gel. So once the fragments have been resolved on the agarose gel, a probe is then designed to bind to the sequence in all cases. In the normal individual, the probe will be able to bind to both of the sequences that have been digested with MST1. And so what you'll see for the healthy individual whose DNA has been cleaved is two fragments, whereas the diseased individual will only display one fragment of DNA on the gel. And this fragment would resolve at a higher length compared to the other sequences. And so in a similar way, as explained in the concept above, RFLP analyses can be used to differentiate between individuals who have diseases if there is a restriction site at which a point mutation is present. RFLPs can also be used in genotyping. In this example, the polymerase chain reaction has been combined with RFLPs. So, I explained to you previously, although we haven't covered the concept of PCR in detail, PCR is used to amplify a specific region of the genome or a particular gene. In this example, alleles of a particular gene have been isolated by PCR. Individuals with the AA allele have a restriction site present in the allele. However, individuals with the recessive allele, small letter A, small letter A, do not have a restriction site present. And so the sequence is not cleaved when individuals have a small a, small a, or recessive genotype. In a heterozygote, you would see three fragments because the individual would have the capital A or the dominant allele on one chromosome and the recessive allele on the other. And so you would see three bands in an individual who is a heterozygote. And so this principle, can therefore be used to genotype individuals. So if we isolate a particular gene by PCR for an individual, depending on the alleles present on their genome, they would either display one single band for a recessive genotype, two bands for a dominant genotype, and three bands for a heterozygotic genotype. And therefore the RFLP can also be used to genotype individuals. And this follows a similar concept as explained with regard to the presence or absence of restriction sites. Restriction enzymes can also be used in a process of restriction mapping. Restriction mapping is a technique that's used to identify the position of restriction sites on a cloned fragment of DNA. The clone can either be a linear fragment, which is cloned by PCR, or a circular fragment such as a plasmid that can be cloned in a bacterial host such as E. coli. We'll be covering how plasmid DNA is cloned in E. coli in the section on molecular cloning. However, a restriction map can establish the number of, the order of, and the distances between restriction enzyme cleavage sites on a cloned segment of DNA. The restriction map is created by cutting the DNA with different restriction enzymes and resolving these fragments on an agarose gel, which separates fragments by size. I will now post a video in the next part of this lesson to give you a better idea of how restriction mapping works. And this is the end of this lecture for today. Thank you.